I greet you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that the Lord has kept you and right now we are ready to move on with our class where we had left before, but I want us to pray first. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, we are grateful to you even this moment. Thank you because of your blessings, your love upon our lives and your wonderful works. May all the glory and honor be to you. Bless us, our souls, and every uh, student that, Lord, we may even continue in faith, and that, Lord, we may study hard by your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you so much. We are ready to proceed from where we had left, and we are doing the course on leadership. So we are moving on with leadership. Yes, we are doing leadership and we saw about the upside down kind of leadership where it's the elders or the people who decides what to be done. And we also saw about uh, the upright uh, triangle whereby God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, which we saw that it's uh, more biblical because the head leader should make the final decision and that's the plan of God and now we want to proceed and look at types of potential leaders types of potential leaders types of potential leaders we want to look at types of potential leaders there are so many leaders but we have the potential leaders how will we know that this is a potential leader and number one we can see that walk with god walk with god always not only at one time but always walks with god always They keep their hearts tender. They keep their hearts tender. And another characteristic is that single-eyed. Single-eyed. So this is one of the criteria of uh, potential leaders. And they are very, very key. Walk with God, always. That one is very key. The reason why we can see that there were some potential leaders that were recommended in the days of the Bible is because of their work with God. And we can see that there are those leaders that failed even from the beginning of their reign. Why? Because they never walked with God always. And also you must have a tender heart and also single-eyed. Single-eyed means that uh, you are focused on to God, you are focused on to the call that God has called you. Nobody called you, people never called you, but God called you. So you won't listen to what people are saying because they will discourage you from leading. And this usually happens even with a lot of uh, church members you find that uh, somebody has been given to lead the choir and uh, probably some members of the choir will begin talking bad about their leader and then the brother or the sister is being discouraged and drops down the position that comes with uh, uh, lack of single eyed the leader must be single eyed god called you it's God who used the pastor to appoint you to that position, praise and worship or any other position. <coughs> Sorry, also in your family, 
you are the leader and so you should not be discouraged very fast because your family looks at you, your wife and your children are looking at you and therefore you have a responsibility you which you must be single-eyed and walk with God. If at all you, are, uh, you have different issues that you are chasing by becoming a leader, then you are wrong. Your only motivation and purpose and focus is God who called you. And what he has called you to do, make sure you are doing it. Otherwise, uh, you will be answerable about it. And another thing, is uh, you will, these are some of the criteria of potential leaders. You will find that walk in personal discipline. They walk in personal, personal discipline. Personal discipline. This means that this person will be able to study the word, will be able to study the word, and also he will be a praying minister. Praying. Well, if you walk in personal discipline, a lot of people are failing in this area. Personal discipline. I once uh, fellowshiped with some church whereby it's the church elders that goes for the overnight cases or vigil, but the pastor cannot attend why he's not disciplined. And these are kind of uh, leaders who will not make impact in their days. A leader must lead and therefore he must walk in personal discipline if it's fasting. I've also seen a good number of leaders whereby you announce we will be fasting and praying on such and such day, but uh, it's all for the sake of announcements themselves. They are not fasting, <laughs> neither pray, but they just announce in church. So that's not having personal discipline. You must be disciplined as a person, as a leader, in any capacity, you must be disciplined in the study of the word, and also you must be a praying person. Otherwise, your leadership will collapse and will fall. You will not be able to attain the divine calls and purpose the Lord had for you. So make sure that you have personal discipline and don't wait. If you are a leader in any capacity, don't wait to be told what to do. You know what to do already and you must do it at the right time in every way. And also, number three, a potential leader will complete Bible school. Complete Bible school. Potential leader must complete Bible school. And there are this theory out there whereby some people believe they don't have to be taught. The Holy Spirit is the best teacher and that's all. So they don't want to go to Bible school. They don't want to study, which is very wrong. Why? Jesus spoke and said, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Those who accept the faith then baptize them and teach them, teach them. The word there is teach them, teach them. So why are you saying that you cannot be taught? Why are you saying that you don't need the Bible school anyway? You have to complete Bible school. It's very, very important for any leader. Uh, Bible school is not only for pastors and preachers. Bible school is for every believer in Jesus Christ. In some developed countries, it's a curriculum in schools and everybody has to go through it. And you can see even like uh, with the Muslims, they have their own style of doing it. And so with us Christians, you must go through Bible school if you are a Christian, not necessarily a leader only, but you must complete Bible school. Very, very key, very, very important. Like now we have started, and I can see that some people are dropping out. Some people are lefting the group for Bible school. I don't understand why. Maybe the expectation 
wasn't the same with the rest and only a few has done even their exams only a few has returned where are the rest we are so many actually the total of all the students we enrolled is more than 300 and right now less than 50 has ha handed back or submitted back their exam sheets what's happening because some people are not ready to move on with studies they are not ready to complete but a good leader must complete bible school work hard study hard and attain the best out of this situation and also we can see you must a good or potential leader must be able to make achievable and realistic goals achievable and realistic goals and realistic realistic goals achievable and realistic goals i have ever heard of a certain brother who was like hey i'm moving out from this church i'm going to start a church and you know what once i start it will be full of people god spoke to me that the first moment i will step out to start a church i will have like 500 people god said but in reality did god say it no it was the inner voice well our inner voice works closely with the holy spirit of god but that does not necessarily mean it's the spirit of god so if you cannot tame your inner feelings and align it by the will and the word of God, then you will find yourself just by yourself. You will find yourself just by your own, doing your own things, thinking that it's God who has spoken to you, but your inner voice is speaking to you. And that's why we are talking about make achievable and realistic goals. Somebody cannot just wake up and by starting a church in one day, 500 people, that's not realistic. And of course, when he st stepped out, it never worked. And guess what? When he realized that it doesn't work, he quitted. He closed the church and uh, he was nowhere to be seen again. So what are we saying? Make achievable and realistic goals. The, wa the reason why most leaders, preachers, pastors are in much... Uh, uh, they are in much depression and stressed and uh, all these sorts of uh, feeling miserable is because they don't make achievable and realistic goals. You want to turn the city upside down, but you don't have the strategy which is realistic. You don't have the strategy which is achievable. How can you just rise up and turn the city upside down? It takes the hand of God for such things to happen and therefore you must be realistic and especially when it comes to finances you must weigh your strength and your weakness because finances plays a very big role in this when you are making your goals don't say that next month i will buy a very big car toyota tx how are you going to achieve it as a pastor or a preacher or a leader or a christian it's impossible. You must have a strategy how you're going to raise the funds, how you're going to save, how you're going to do it. You cannot just say, I'll just wake up and build a hundred million a cathedral. How are you going to achieve it? You will be so much stressed and miserable. So make sure that you make achievable and realistic goals. And these, uh, with all the faith you are having, with all the strong faith you believe in God, you must make it achievable and realistic. And something else here is that uh, acquire some more experience. Acquire, acquire more experience. Acquire more experience knowledge 
you must acquire some more knowledge and also this one we call it endless process endless process endless process <coughs> acquiring more experience experience of course comes with time the more you keep on doing something the more you are experienced in it and also you must acquire more knowledge more knowledge comes by reading studying the word of god reading books uh, for inspirational books uh, and also uh, being exposed you interact with people you interact with different caliber of people who are god fearing men of god servants of god and therefore you acquire much knowledge this is an endless process and i cannot stand here even to boast that I know it all. I don't know it all. I am still learning as well, the same way as you are learning. And I can attest that um, when we announce that we are starting this free Bible school uh, classes, you know what happened? There are some pastors who are feeling that they, they have known it all and they felt that they cannot enroll to study the Bible. Of course, nobody has attained it all. I'm also a learner, a student and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And actually, somebody said that, well, I think that I don't need it. I have graduated with A, B, C, D, all these papers, whatever, whatever. That's fine and okay. But as far as I am concerned, we, this is an endless process until you die and uh, you are forgotten. Just like Paul said, I have fought a good fight and I have finished the race. That is when now we can say that uh, you, have, you are done. But as long as you are alive, every single moment you will be learning something and it's, it will be of great importance to you. And another thing is that uh, types of potential leaders, they don't fight for responsibilities. They don't fight, don't fight for responsibilities. Responsibilities. Every potential leader will not fight for responsibilities because if God has given you the mandate to lead, you don't have to fight for it. God will make sure that you are in the right place. David never fought for responsibilities, and as much as he was anointed king of Israel, he was still tending the flocks, he still served Saul, and he was waiting for God to install him right where he belonged. God brought him from the bush and sat him, gave him the kingship over the greatest nation, Israel, and this is a very good example to emulate for us as leaders who are coming up. We must learn that we should not fight for responsibilities. And I've seen it happening even with pastors fellowships and preachers forums. Everybody want to show how they are powerful, how they are uh, literate, how they are well educated and how they have a lot of resources and wealth. They are the ones that um, should be heard and nobody should say a word, which is very wrong. We cannot do this because we will fail miserably. We must not fight for responsibilities. And another thing is that uh, spiritual fellowship with other members of the body, spiritual fellowship, Fellowship. Fellowship with other with other members of the body. Members of the body. So how are you relating to other members of the church? Don't be uh, egocentric kind of a person whereby you are full of yourself, eh? 
you don't want to fellowship with other preachers, you don't want to fellowship with other people. If you are a leader in any capacity, you must uh, have fellowship with other people as well. I've seen preachers who are saying like, uh, hey, I don't need to sit with the people, I need to sit with God, it's okay, it's fine. But remember, not all the time you will be sitting with God. You are on earth, God is in heaven. You also need the warmth of other people. You also need encouragement. You also need um, that fellowship, just discussing, talking, interacting. You need it, definitely you need it. Some preachers said, but I don't want anything to do with people. So God, if you love pe God, you love people. If you don't love people, then you don't love God. It's that simple. You must learn to love people, live with people, however difficult they may be. You must understand them and live with them because you live with people. And I remember one preacher was telling him, go and find your world and live there alone. <laughs> so what are we saying? We are saying we must learn to live with people. However difficult they may be, we cannot all be the same. We must be different because we have different temperaments and we will come to learn about temperaments later also and now we want to look at profile of uh, various pastors profile profiles of various pastors Okay, here it says various pastor because it's a symbol of leadership, but it applies to every leader in any capacity, every person. And of course, everybody is a leader. If you are a mama or a woman, you are leading your children. Your husband is leading the entire house. The wife leads the children. And everybody is a leader in their own capacity. You can be a leader at the place of work. You can be a team leader in your organization. And all these are some of the profiles we can look at. And we can see that number one, number one here, we are talking about energetic, energetic both spiritually and physically spiritually and physically F physically energetic spiritually and physically well, a lot of people are emphasizing so much about the spirituality, but they forget that um, if you are not fit physically, then you cannot be fit spiritually. Because the physical body homes the spiritual body. The spiritual person is accommodated in the physical person. And therefore, you need to be energetic both spiritually and physically. Don't be a weak person physically because otherwise you will kill the spiritual person. You need strength. You need to exercise. You need to do some exercise. You need to keep yourself fit. You need to keep yourself strong. I've heard of a good number of people saying like, I don't care if I'm weak physically, then I'm strong spiritually but they apply it in the wrong way. Don't be careless, don't be careless with your body. Take care of yourself. The Bible says, don't you know that your bodies are holy temples of God and the Holy Spirit lives in your body and the Holy Spirit lives in your body. So you must take well care of yourself health-wise, make sure you are in good health. If it means dieting, diet, and do the necessary because as a leader you need the physical strength. You cannot stand to preach powerfully 
if you are very weak and collapsing you have to be physically fit uh, f uh, full your stomach is full eat well diet well but i'm not saying you should not fast fasting and praying is the is biblical you have to do it but when you are not doing it make sure you keep yourself fit and strong do some exercise and or be okay so that you can do the work of god and another thing is contemplating be contemplating Contemplating means you look thoughtfully for a long time. Look thoughtfully for a long time. Thoughtfully for a long time. Look thoughtfully for a long time. What does that mean? It simply means that uh, don't be rushing to things. You have to take time and look into them thoughtfully. Don't be rushing into things. You must look at them. Ideas may come, uh, opinions may come, but don't rush into them. Look into them carefully as a leader in any capacity. Make sure that you think about them. Give them a second thought before you implement them or before you engage yourself. Otherwise, you might find yourself in a very wrong place and doing very wrong things. So another thing we can look at is uh, Okay, something else we are talking about here is administrative. Administrative. We are talking about administrative. This is good management. Good management, good management or organized, good management or organized. Uh, this one will bring us, someday we shall learn about financial management or financial stewardship because it's a a leader in any capacity you must uh, be administrative whereby you uh, you exercise good management and well organized there are people who are not organized yet they are leaders they are so much disorganized that they can just do anything anytime but this will help you as an energetic kind of a leader and another thing is devotional devotional you must be devotional what does this mean give all the most give all or give most of one's time resources it talks about giving or give all or most of one's time of one's time or resources or resources or resources uh -huh. give all or most of one's time or resources give devotion be devotional which means to give all or most 
of one's time or resources to any position you've been placed in any leadership capacity you must devote yourself fully to it commit yourself fully to whatever you are doing and something else is that uh, teaching teaching you need to be knowledgeable so that you can teach for you to teach what do you do you are giving out knowledge give out knowledge so what i'm doing right now is to give out knowledge give out knowledge so as an energetic leader you need to be teaching but you cannot teach of course if you don't know what to teach you must be taught first then now you can teach you give out knowledge you can only give what you have you cannot give what you don't have and therefore you can only teach when you have been taught and you have something to teach this is why it's very important for people to be taught and number six is preaching number six is preaching and this means that uh, sermon delivery preaching speaks of sermon delivery Salmon delivery. Salmon delivery. So, what's the salmon? The salmon is good news about Jesus Christ. So, we must be very careful when we are preaching because what are we preaching? Preaching is okay, you are preaching, I'm preaching, we are preaching. But what are you preaching? We should preach good news about Jesus Christ. We should preach good news about Jesus Christ. Don't preach people. Don't preach your wealth. Don't preach your family. Preach Jesus. A lot of people are very busy taking a lot of time introducing their wives and their children, introducing how successful they are, introducing so many things. And some, they are very busy with introduction, giving big names and all these kind of stuffs instead of all this just preach about jesus preach the good news preach the good tidings and that will be of great benefits and a blessing and number seven is visionary i'm talking about visionary be focused and consistent to your goal focused and consistent consistent to your goals there are people who are never consistent they start something they leave it on the way that is not being a good leader when you start something make sure you finish it if you've started a church, make sure that church continues. Keep focus and be consistent to this goal. If you have started some choir, if you've started some project, if you've started doing something, don't leave it halfway. Make sure that you are focused to it, keep on with it, uh, be consistent with it until you accomplish it. That's being a good leader. Make sure you keep focused. Make sure you are consistent. Don't leave it on the way until you accomplish it. And number eight, it talks about servant again. Servant. Serve. A servant must serve and not to be served. We have said this severally and we have to keep on mentioning it emphasizing on it because a lot of leaders today have become bosses don't be a boss make sure you are always serving you are a servant of all i want to talk about calling
I want to talk about calling. This is calling. And we are having the Greek word for calling. Greek word is uh, klesis. Klesis. This is the Greek word for calling, which speaks of a call. A call, invitation, invitation, summon, summon. It also talk. Uh, it talks about a call, invitation, or a summon as to a banquet. You can be summoned, come to the banquet and I want to speak about five major calls five major calls five major calls what are these five major calls number one is called to salvation we've been called to salvation Before you become a leader, make sure you are saved. Before you become a leader, make sure you are saved. Don't be a leader who is not saved. We have preachers who are not saved. We have leaders who are not saved. But make sure the call to salvation, you've responded to it. A call to salvation. These five major calls, they apply both to... Uh, both people, whether you are saved or not, whether you are saved or not, these are five major calls. Whether you are saved or not, you are called to salvation, and therefore you must respond to this call. In number two, called to the local assembly. You've been called to the local assembly. To the local assembly. The local assembly. This one I want to emphasize on it. We've been called to the local assembly. This means every Christian must have a local assembly where they belong. Every, lo every called person, every believer in Christ must have a local assembly where you go to church. There are people who doesn't go to church. They feel that churches are so boring. They feel that churches are so bad, but you must belong to a church. You must belong to a church. If you are not comfortable in my church, please, you can move to the next church, but make sure you are in a church. Don't stay at home because the devil is separating you. He wants you to be lonely so that he can kill you. He can deal with you when you are alone, but all the time make sure that you are in the local assembly, you are under a pastor, and you are in some church. There is no perfect church under heaven. I want to assure you, there is no perfect church. Even where I minister, it's not a perfect church. And you will never ever find a perfect church. What we do is that we must fellowship, we must belong to a certain assembly, we must belong to the body of Christ. And that one is very key, if you understand it. The pastor may have offended you. The people may have offended you. You may be feeling that you cannot stay there. But if that be the case, you can move to the next one, and God will still speak to you there. But don't throw words. Don't throw insults. Don't talk ill about the pastor of the church. Don't talk about the brethren there. When you go to the new place of fellowship, just fellowship and keep quiet and God will bless you. And we are also having another call here, which is called to grow, called to grow, called to grow. Everybody is called to grow. You don't have to remain the same. You learn the word of God. You grow in the knowledge of God. You grow in the knowledge of Christ and the Bible says that Christ grew up 
in all manner. He grew in stature. He grew in the word. Spiritually, you are growing. And also called to disciple. That's number four. Called to be disciple. To be disciple. We are all called to be disciples. Then we are called to disciple. So you must first become a disciple before you start discipling other people. You must yourself become a disciple. And the reason why I'm saying this, I want to give a, a certain story, which was a true story that happened in the, in the past. A lot of people want people to, they want to disciple people, but themselves they are not disciples. This means you must change first for you to be able to change people. You cannot expect people to change, yet yourself you've not changed. And that's why you hear a lot of people are having problems in this life. They are saying that people don't change. They want to change people, but themselves they have not been changed. So you must first be changed before you change people. And this story comes like there was a certain priest who died and by his grave was found a script written and it was reading, I first wanted to change the world but with the time I realized that the world cannot change. So I decided that I will just change my country and I struggled to change my country. And with time, I also realized that my country is not changing either. So I narrowed it down to my family. And I said, instead of changing the country, I'll change my family. And I struggled so hard to change my family. But I realized that my family could not change as well. So now I lie on my grave. I wish I could have changed myself first because if I could have changed myself then I could uh, myself could have changed the family and the family could have changed the country and the country could have changed the whole world. So what does this t teach us? It teaches us that we need to first change. Of course we cannot change by ourselves. We need the grace of God to change us. We need the power of God to change us. But we must yield ourselves to change. We, may, we need to accept the change that God is making in our lives. It might not be easy, but we have to. So before you think about discipling other people, you must first be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And now we want to move on. Calling was always God's invitation and exclusive right of privilege. Calling was always God's invitation and exclusive right of privilege. Right of privilege. Those are the five major calls, the five major calls. We have other callings which we want to look at. Those are the five major ones, but we have some more other under the major five which we want to look at. And we have these types of callings, types of callings. These are some of the types of calling because everybody is talking about call, call, call. I'm called, I'm called. We have number one, a sure calling. A sure calling. And this sure calling, you can find it in Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter one, verse 10. This one is to believers. 
This one is to believers. We are having a sure calling. A sure calling. And number two, we have heavenly calling. Heavenly calling. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10. This is from above. The calling from above. Of course, all are from above. But we must differentiate them according to the scriptures. We are also having holy calling. Holy calling. We also have a holy calling, which is Second Timothy. Second Timothy one nine. Second Timothy one verse nine. This is being set apart unto God. Holy calling deals with set apart for God. We've been set apart for God. We, as Christians, we've been set apart for God. And we have what we call the high calling. High calling. You'll find it in Philippians 3.14. Philippians chapter 3 verse 14 This is far above flesh far above flesh High calling this is far above flesh and we are having number 5 we call it hopeful calling Awful calling. We find it in Ephesians 1 18. Ephesians 1 verse 18. We can also talk about powerful calling. Powerful calling. And this one we can see it in Matthew 10 7. Matthew 10 verse 7 we talk about grace calling number 7 grace calling and grace calling we can find it in Ephesians 3 verse 7 Ephesians 3 verse 7 and this is what we call eternal purpose. This is what we call eternal purpose. Eternal purpose. God has eternal purpose for us that we may live with him forever. And we also have humble calling. Humble calling. Humble calling we find it in Matthew 9, Mark 9. Mark chapter 9 and verses 35, you'll find a humble calling there. Those are some of the other callings, but we also have this one we call We are also having this one we call call of God. Call of God. This is the specific function. Specific. Specific function. Specific function. Or place God has for. Place God has for believers. In his plan. He 
in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ. We can see that one in Romans 11. Romans 11. You can also find it in 1 Corinthians 11.29, right? 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, you can look at chapter 1, verse 26. You can also find it in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7, verse 20, 7, verse 20, and also Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Well, this is the one that uh, is the major one. And uh, all of them are very important because a sure calling for believers, heavenly calling, holy calling, high calling, the grace calling for eternal purpose are important. But most of us, we usually speak of this call of God, whereby you've been called to serve in a specific place in the local assembly. You've been called as a minister of the gospel. You've been called as a musician. You've been called to do something in church, hospitality, ushering, and all this kind. That's where it falls. And that's what most of us are aware of and are talking of from time and again. What's your call? When somebody asks you, what's your call? Then there is where he means in most cases. And that's it. And we also want to look at the gift. We have something that we call the gift. Somebody may ask you, what's, what's your gift? What's the gift you've been given? What's your gift? Some people have been gifted, but they don't want to use their gifts in church. Some of them, they want to be paid so that they can serve God with their gifts. They want to be paid. They want to be paid unless you put money there, they cannot do it. So we are talking about gift. And the Greek word for gift, Greek word for the Greek word for gift is doron. And the doron is a gift offering. This is a gift offering. Doron present. Present. If somebody has ever given you a present, that's called the wrong benefit. Benefit. That's called benefit. And also we can see bless the receiver. Bless the receiver. That's where you find a lot of pastors are like, uh, would you bless me? Or some, they bless the pastor. They give the pastor a gift. They give the leader a gift. They buy the, the preacher a car if they're in position too. That's called the run. And we can see that we, that one in Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2.8. Two eight Ephesians two eight and also four verse seven four verse seven and again we are having another Greek word for gift another Greek word for gift which is called charisma this is called charisma this is result of grace. Result Result of grace or favor. Result of grace or favor.
You can find it in Romans 11.29. And there are so many other scriptures there which you'll read by yourself once I hand you over the notes. Charisma is the result of grace or favor. And actually, it's different from this one. This one is a free will. You just feel like you give somebody a present or a gift. But this one is a result of the grace. So the ministerial gifts are falling here under charisma, whereby they are a result of grace or favor that God bestows upon an individual. And we want to look at the type of gifts the type of gifts, then we will end our class from that point until next class. So we want to look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, no, types of gifts. Let's look at the type of gifts. Type of gifts. Types of gifts. The type of gifts. We have the gifts of God. Gift of God. This speaks of eternal life. Eternal life. Gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says it, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We also have got marriage. Marriage is also a gift from God. And uh, you should be aware that not all people have been called to marriage. Not all people have been given the gift of marriage. They can try and fail so many times. Some were meant to remain as celibacies and uh, they cannot manage marriage. So if you can manage marriage, that's a gift from God and thank God for it. And also we have got children. Children are also a gift. Because there are so many people who doesn't have children. In as much as they try to have children, they find they cannot bear children. And we also have these gifts, which are called gift of Jesus. This is number two. This is gifts, gifts of Jesus or Jesus the Son. So what are these gifts? These are grace. Grace is a result of uh, Jesus dying on the cross. We have favor. We also have eternal life. Eternal life. And we have salvation. We have salvation. So we can see the gifts of Jesus. We receive grace through Jesus Christ. His death on the cross. We attain favor. We attain eternal life. In salvation, we are only saved through Jesus Christ. And in the past class, we had seen that, um, we had seen in the past class that we can only reconcile to God through confession and believing. That's how we enter into covenant with God, through confession and believing. And we are having number three, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? 
we have pastors we have pastors we have prophets we have teacher teachers we have apostles and we have evangelists we have evangelists and we have exhortation there are people who are very good in exhortation we have people who are very good in exhortation and that's a gift so with those types of gifts we want to end our class until the next class on leadership we shall proceed from where we have left and i just want to thank you all may god bless you so much even for concentrating on your studies and god is good and faithful thank you so much let's pray father we are grateful to you even for this moment we've come to the end of our class today may all the glory and honor be to you thank you for every student bless us and keep us safe in your arms we may find solace all the time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.